Financial argument. Follow us on YouTube. Does Eastern Europe stand a chance in the chaos that's about to ensue in the West? And or, what is the best course of action for Eastern Europe now as we again face two fronts? The West, that's gone batshit insane on one side, and an already batshit insane Putin on the other. How do we navigate this global madness? That's from Ellie. Hey, how you doing? Hi, how are you? Well, thanks. Well, thanks. Um, anything, anything you want to add to this rather wide of scope question? <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, maybe I was being a little harsh there, but um, it just feel like um, you know, I was I was born in the Soviet Union. I was only five years old uh, when it fell, but um, all my life it felt like we we were living between sort of a, a stick and the carrot, the stick being Russia, and the carrot being the West, because we always wanted to be like the West, you know, want the um, the great economy me and the freedom of speech and and all these things and now that we're here um suddenly we see that western europe actually does not want any of that anymore it just seems like the west is on um i don't know how else to call it suicidal so on the other hand russia is as it always was it has uh, nothing's changed so we're just not sure what's going on here are we are we um on our own again or or what's what's happening yeah i mean it's a it's a good question, and um, you know I'm I'm no geopolitist, uh, but uh, I can certainly give some thoughts with regards to what's happened in Western Europe. And uh, let me let me give you one theory first, Ellie, and, and then you can tell me what you think. Europeans are pretty good at killing. I mean, in terms of like you know they've had their empires, they've had their wars. And there has always been a strong martial spirit in Europe. And part of me, you know, I, when you see an entire culture taking all of the steps necessary to create massive violent conflict within their own borders, part of me, I just, I wonder, and tell me what you think. Do you think maybe Europeans are just really tired of peace and are just looking for a war? Uh, well, that was going to be my next question. Um, I mean, are we Europeans are are even capable of peace? Because um, you know, we had some decades of peace and prosperity, and now it's it's leading. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to have another you know crystal night in Europe in in, yeah. in the next few years. So, <laughs> are, are we just that you know, are we just that horrible people then? Well, again, horrible or not, I just um, I wonder. Like, I wonder if just Europe has become so decadent that people are just like, eh, let's just set up these problems and set up these problems and set up these problems. And let's go back to what we used to be great at, which was just giant slaughterhouses of a continent. And, um, you know, the, the restlessness and energy, creativity, and nonconformity of the Western spirit has its real plus side. And I think in the free market, it creates absolutely wonderful things. But when combined with the state, European restlessness and nonconformity and so on is very dangerous, very dangerous indeed. And when you see people inviting their historical enemies to come and live, not just to come and live, but to actually subsidize them coming in. The people who have wanted to take over Europe forever, who have it in their ideology to take over the entire world, who are very clear about what it is they want to invite, to pay these people co to come in. I don't know how Europe hasn't just turned into an entire goddamn Fifty Shades of Grey novel. Okay, you can hit me, but only with a barbed whip, and I'll pay you for it. And it's like, I don't know how it, to look at it any other way. It is so completely clear. To anyone with half a brain and a, a single functioning eyeball, what's going on? It's really impossible to imagine how they don't just want what's coming. Like they don't just want to have a war. And um, this is uh, somebody who wrote uh, and uh, wrote in from Serbia. He said, "I already gave up and moved to Serbia back in 2014. I've had more economic freedom and liberty here than I would have had back in the United States. He said he was in New Jersey. Plus, I live very comfortably now. So I can't imagine going back anytime soon. The Serbians 
here have even proved to be mostly unaffected by the migrant crisis here as they offered the migrants land but the catch was they had to live off the land by themselves as in no welfare or handouts not a single taker and so they moved on to germany and sweden so good luck but it wouldn't hold my breath so um yeah i i think that um the lack of self-knowledge uh, lack of uh, listening to philosophers when people so assiduously pursue a path that is going to lead them into violence, I simply am only going to assume that is the violence they want. Camille Paglia, uh, I think an American um, writer on, on feminism and gender issues, she, she said years ago about women who provoke their husbands into beating them up. It's like, well, maybe is it, it, it's possible that they're just really kinky and like getting beaten up before they have sex because it makes the sex hotter. And there are people who are turned on by violence. There are people who are only get their emotional energies up and running through violence. They're torpid and depressed in the absence of violence. And it could be that um, Europe has become so torpid and depressed because it's lost its culture, it's lost its history, it's lost any sense of self-respect, it's lost any sense of its own value, that the only way it can rouse itself is through violence and this is why sort of unconsciously this is uh, what is occurring in Europe it's just a guess but that level of pathology that level of self-hatred that level of openly inviting and paying people coming in who whose ideology wants them to conquer you and subjugate you it is truly uh, an astounding phenomenon and at least the Romans um, well they just didn't pay their mercenaries they didn't actually pay them to come in and <laughs> anyway so um, it is, it is quite something. What the answer is going to be, I don't know. But I think fundamentally um, it comes down to an ignorance of biology. I know that sounds really abstract, but the more I think about it, which doesn't mean the more I'm right, I'm just, you know, maybe I'm stuck in a groove. But there is such a degree of hatred for white Europeans and, you know, whites all over the world. There's such a degree of hatred. And it is, you know, what people say, well, why are you focusing on IQ? Why are you focusing on IQ? Well, because, because, because everyone, most people believe, most people believe everyone is the same around the world, that, that, you know, Africans are just like Europeans, but they were pillaged by Europeans and that's why they're poor. And, and Africans like the, the blacks in America, they're just like everyone else. And so the reason why they're so poor and dysfunctional is because white racism and slavery. So everyone is the same. Therefore, all different outcomes must be due to immorality, must be due to evil, either current evil like racism and systemic blah, 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 or historical evils like um, slavery and colonialism and blah, 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 blah. So everyone is the same, and therefore all disparate outcomes must and can only be due to immorality. And so in white-dominated societies, all non-white groups who do badly must be doing badly because of either current or historical white evil. That, 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 that it sort of follows logically from everyone's the same, and therefore any group that's doing better as a whole must be doing better, not because they're better, but because they're worse, because they're racist and exploiters and, and so on, right? Like people genuinely make the argument that the only reason America is wealthy is because it had slaves, yeah, like the whole world has had slaves for like 100,000 years and it sure as hell didn't become wealthy until there was private property rights and self-ownership in the 19th century. So if people genuinely make this case. They look at the sky towers of Manhattan and they look at the ocean liners and they look at the roads and they look at like, and they see, well, that's all built on the skulls and bones of slaves. And the only reason why, and so this basic belief creates such a vicious amount of self-hatred among whites and they're continually verbally abused. You're doing better, therefore you must have stolen your wealth from other people because it's a zero-sum game, everyone's the same. And this argument that everyone's the same, let me finish in a sec, the argument that everyone is the same is creating such vicious anti-white hatred that unless the facts actually come to the forefront and the races are not the same, Ethnicities are not the same. The biology, the brain size, the IQ, they're different. Even the level of twinning is different in that sub-Saharan Africans twin at four times or five times or six times the rate of East Asians in terms of because you know, our selection and so on, right? 
So the idea that the races, when separated by 100,000 years of wildly disparate environments, have ended up the same is wildly anti-scientific, anti-biological. And it is a fundamental delusion that literally is destroying the world. Because to think that Europeans are the same as Africans, but Europeans are rich and Africans are poor, therefore the Europeans are rich because the Africans are poor, because everyone's the same, creates massive sympathy towards the Africans and massive hatred towards the Europeans. And this hatred that has been poured into the heart of Europeans, like this repeated leftist viper adder striking at the jugular over and over and over, systemic racism, misogyny, patriarchy, cisgendered scum, whatever, you, all of this stuff, this Iago vicious verbal abuse poured into white ears for the past couple of generations has borne fruit. And so the Europeans are like, well, People in the Middle East are only dysfunctional because they're not in Europe. Put them in Europe and they'll be just like us. And it's a fundamental rejection of basic biological facts that in the Middle East, and again, these are questionable figures in terms of the detail, but I think in approximation, they're probably somewhat accurate. In the Middle East, you have IQs in the low 80s. In the low 80s. That's lower than American blacks, uh, which clock in at 85 to 87 depending on various measurements. And, you know, it's for a variety of reasons, you know, not least of which, as I've mentioned about a billion times, is because of cousin marriages that drop the IQ 10 to 18 points. So you've got genetically undermined low IQ populations. They're going to come into Europe and they're going to do badly. And because everyone thinks everyone is the same, the only reason that they can be doing badly is because of evil white Europeans, being racist, being scum, rejecting whatever, and being white supremacist. Like, so this fundamental misapprehension is the, and I just mentioned this, it's the greatest lie and falsehood and destructive belief in the world at the moment. And so much of society has been structured around this fantasy that everyone's the same and environment determines everything which is specifically and explicitly rejected by just about every scientific measure that you can imagine. And people who get offended by this, don't shoot me, I'm only the messenger. We've had a wide variety of intelligence experts on this show talking about their data, stepping us through it. We've got the graphs, we've got the sources. Don't get mad at me for telling you that it's raining just because you don't want to get wet. So in Eastern Europe, I don't know what the philosophy is. I've heard some rumblings that women are turning more towards Western style feminism, which again, it's the same thing. Men and women are absolutely the same, completely identical. And therefore any disparity of outcomes must be due to hateful, heterosexual, white male sexism, patriarchy, right? And it's nonsense. Men and women are not the same. I mean, even if we take out the biological brain differences, we can at least point out that women have babies and men don't. And again, if you call that unfair, well, don't get mad at me because you don't want to get wet and I'm telling you it's raining. So I don't know the degree to which there is common sense or at least curiosity about these matters because all that has to happen to break propaganda is for us to be curious. Curiosity is the antithesis of propaganda. If propaganda tells you these are the answers, curiosity says, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look into that myself. It's called having a brain, being skeptical, thinking for yourself and following the data. And, uh, you know, for instance, if you look at the disparity in the number of blacks in prison in America, they, ah, well, so many more blacks are in prison in America. It's got to be because of racism. Well, smart people, people with half a brain and one functioning eyeball will say, okay, that's a hypothesis. And it's a hypothesis coming from the softer sciences of whatever bullshit political science, criminology, nonsense comes up with this stuff. Not that criminology is nonsense. We've had Dr. Beaver on. I like criminology as a whole. But the leftist infection of these things has turned the very softest kinds of hypothesis into a truth more robust than physics. And, and this, you know, I remember, you know, I took a course on race relations when I was in university. And um, these were the answers. It is because of racism. And I said, well, you know, West African blacks have a higher per capita income than, than blacks, so it can't just be racism because they're physically indistinguishable, particularly in the second generation from um, African Americans. And the teacher was like, well, that's slavery. And it's just, boom, that's the answer. And I remember thinking like, boy, you know, that's a very complex topic. 
why are blacks doing so badly in, in America? It's a complex topic. I'd like to know the actual proof behind this thesis. And that's, of course, when I began sort of reading up on this stuff. Like, you know, it seems plausible, but the stuff that seems plausible and is very popular is usually the most toxic and dangerous stuff at all. Plausibility plus popularity equals, eh, sorry, you've just destroyed civilization. So the basic rejection of reality is what destroys civilizations. And the basic rejection of morality is what seals their fate. In other words, the destruction gets set underway through delusion. And then because the delusion is associated with moral good, like earlier in the show, I said, if you take something as a moral absolute, you have no negotiating room. And if you take that talking about any biological differences between the races is evil racism or talking about white self-interest is white supremacy or KKK evil Nazi wants to gas a million, <laughs> right? Then you've no room to negotiate and everybody just has to scream down people who talk about basic biological realities. And, you know, such a society that hurls all of its emotional and moral indignation against people who are speaking basic biological realities. Such civilizations, you say, don't deserve in a way to survive, but it doesn't matter what deserve is meaningless in this context. They simply want a man who runs off a cliff thinking he can fly. Does he deserve to die? Well, I don't know. I guess his beliefs led him that way, but uh, he sure as heck isn't going to do very well that day. And so, I don't know what other belief systems out where you are. Do people accept that there are incompatibilities between cultures that can't be solved by wishful thinking? Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, maybe maybe it really has to do with this um, this Western guilt, this white guilt. Let's say, you know, oh, we we used to be imperialists, so therefore we must pay now, right? Because that's that's pretty much the, the argument there. Um, well, Lithuania has only been independent for twenty six. Yeah, so, you know, we're still kind of attached to our country. We still, you know, we value our history and our, our culture. Uh, we we kind of like living here, you know, we feel good about it. So we absolutely do not understand how you just turn away from from everything that, that means, your you know, your nationality, your identity, your culture, everything, and just go like, well, right from now on, everyone's equal, everyone's, you know, multiculturalism and all that. We just don't get it. And another thing is we... Uh, we're absolutely astonished to hear this this narrative that you know, like you just mentioned, that oh, America was built on 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 on, the, on slave labor and and things like that. That used to be the Soviet Union narrative that we used to hear, right? Because if they want to push their own propaganda, they're going to have to um, they're going to need a big enemy, and of course, that was the evil capitalists in the West. So this is what we used to hear, and this is <laughs> it used to be absolutely ridiculous to us because we knew this is propaganda. And now, you know, we're, we joined the NATO, we joined the EU, we feel, you know, we're kind of there. And now the West is saying, oh, actually, yeah, you know, all that was true. Uh, we just, <laughs> well, no, we that's, just... that's because that's because that's because almost all the intellectuals in the West are various degrees of communists and socialists. And it was an explicit plan of the Communist Party to pretend that everyone was equal and all inequalities results from bad people in charge of capitalism, which is an unjust system. So all the people who created the conditions which led rise to socialism and communism in Europe um, fled communism, came to America and uh, North, uh, North America and Europe and set up the same goddamn system that is resulting in this. It's all communist propaganda, all of this racial egalitarianism. It's all just all communist propaganda. That's not me made up. That's very explicit in the uh, annals of the communist history and their purpose. Exactly, and this is what, you know, um, when I was like 18 or 19 years old, um, we used to hitchhike all over Europe um, with friends and, you know, just going to festivals and, and doing what young people do. And I remember being in Spain, um, so that's like, what, 12 years ago, something like that, and we were just talking to some local, you know, hippie and then some music festival or whatever. And when they learned that we were from Lithuania, they were like, oh, my God, you're so lucky, you know, you got to live in the Soviet Union. That must have been so amazing and so awesome. And at first we thought, well, surely they're joking or, or they're high or I don't know so what, what's going on. But no, they were, they were that serious. They really honestly believed that Soviet Union was great, you know, and, and that we were living the dream. And, and we tried to explain to them what it really was and that Stalin was probably even worse than Hitler and, and all these things and Siberian gulags and all that. And they just wouldn't believe us. And, and we would just completely, completely, I don't know, horrified that, you know, 
you have all the tools to get the information to 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 educate yourself to but no there's this this tale that that everyone believes and we just for us it's absolutely incomprehensible because we live there we know what that now we don't want to go back and yet the west is kind of headed that way and and we just i don't get it <laughs> well you know there are two types of public figures in the world there are the people who will make you feel good and there are people who will tell you the truth and people who have any depth or intelligence or moral responsibility or concern for the future will step aside the snake oil salesmen who tell them what they want to hear and who make them feel good girl power right and they will step aside those people as dangerous sophists who destroy the world and instead they will go they would go to the people and grit their teeth and say give it to me straight give me the facts give me what i need to hear to save the world and right now the people who tell the people what they want to hear, run the world. They run the media in particular. And the people who are telling the truth, uh, who are telling the facts, regardless of what people's feelings are, are very much in the hated minority. As in general, throughout a lot of human history, they have been. I mean, people love the easy drug of syrupy, sweet, decaying words. They do not like the harsh, blunt, basic, epistemological truths that make them uncomfortable and set them in conflict with their fellow man and fellow woman. And so sophists rule, philosophers drool <laughs> these days. But, um, you know, you keep making your predictions, and then when you're proven right, you gain authority, even if it's just in hindsight and hopefully not after it's too late. Right, but then, um, you know, you, you mentioned this before, and I again, it's quite obvious, this, um, this moral stand, you know, oh, we must help... Um, the less fortunate we must, um, you know, uh, allow all these migrants in. We must, uh, we must give them a hand and, and all that. So this is a kind of like, like you said, feel good about about myself kind of syndrome. Um, but uh, what I don't get then is actually war going on in Ukraine right now, right? And there's uh, thousands of refugees coming from the Ukraine, and they're not allowed in. Nobody yep. wants to hear about them. Uh, nobody, you know, and, and these are, you know, your next door people. They're, you know, culturally compatible. They're, they're basically, you know, they're like literally um, living next door and uh, they're not allowed in. Uh, I mean, we do have some Ukrainian refugees in Lithuania and, and they're integrating just fine. They're getting jobs. They're learning the language. Everything is absolutely fine. We're happy to help. But then, uh, you know, recently there was a referendum. Um, Ukraine wants to become, uh, well, eventually a EU member state, but for now just um, an associate state. And there was a referendum in the Netherlands, and the Dutch people said no. Whereas there's talks about um, letting Turkey into the EU. So how, how does that happen then? What do you mean? How does what happen? Sorry, I just missed that. Um, you know, uh, if if they, they they don't want Ukraine, not even in the EU, they don't even want Ukraine to become a EU associate state, right? But uh, when it comes to Turkey, that's fine. You know, let's uh, let's let, let them all in, let them in the EU, uh, let them travel freely. Um, they do, they they're not going to need visas anymore. That's absolutely fine. So all the Muslim migrants are fine, but you know, like I said, next door people, the Ukrainian people, not so much. What? Oh, right. Well, look, <laughs> the way that decisions are made as a society and for most individuals, right? So the way that decisions are made these days is very simple, and it's called the path of least resistance. So if Turkey is rejected, then Turkey will make a great stink. And there are millions of Turkish people living in Germany, right? They were originally brought in as um, guest workers, right? And they stayed and so on. They've not assimilated. And I think 70% of them are on welfare. So it's some usual nonsense, right? And so if Germany or Europe uh, or, or countries in Europe that have substantial Turkish populations, if they reject Turkey, then they may face civil unrest in their own countries. So they'll accommodate Turkey. On the other hand, not accommodating Lithuania, not, not accommodating Lithuania, what does that cost anyone? People aren't making decisions based on principles anymore. 
they're making decisions based on which group is going to cause the most trouble. Okay, I'll appease that group. If you are not someone who causes the most trouble, you will get screwed. And this is a race to the lowest common denominator where everyone ends up being like a squawking bird in a nest or they don't get any food at all. I've always had the suspicion in my life, like I'm a pretty nice person and um, not wildly confrontational or anything like that, but I've always had this suspicion in my life that, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, that the person who is the least rational, the least accommodating, the most aggressive, well, that person will get their way. And the person who's most accommodating will get screwed. In other words, to be a reasonable human being is to lose, to be an unreasonable human being is to win. I've always had that kind of suspicion in the world. I will not say that my suspicion has been allayed by the last, I don't know, 49 and a half years. (laughs) So so I, I would imagine that's why it's happening. Right, it's it's hard to disagree with that, but um, I always had a feeling that it's mostly you know the politicians that want to keep the people quiet, right? Because because um, they depend on the right. vote and, and Lithuanians, and all that. So, Lithuanians, so, Lithuanians are more reasonable than Turkish people, and so Turkish <laughs> people will be, and in general, right? So Turkish people can do more harm to politicians in Europe than Lithuanians can, and therefore Turkish yeah. people will be appeased. Yeah, you see, but that was, that's why it was so surprising to hear that this was not um, uh, some politician who decided. That there was actually a referendum in the Netherlands, right? So the people had the say, and they said no to you know Ukraine becoming um, a EU associate state. It wasn't it wasn't just some politician or or for, for some, which, someone for which wrestled. you should for which you should be enormously grateful. They have done you. No, you cannot come on the Titanic. I will not stamp your ticket. You know, I think that. That is, you know, staying away from the EU seems like just about the most sensible policy. Heck, if I could go off planet to get further away from the EU, I'd be tempted. So they've probably done you an enormous favor by complying with um, the least rational elements of their society. Like, I would give you a tiny example here, right? So I did this this, uh, video on the John Gomeshi trial. And you don't need the details. You can watch it if you want. But in the judge's ruling, he said, yeah, these women lied under oath. Lied under oath. Repeatedly extensively. And the punishment for lying under oath, well, it's a criminal, it's not civil, it's a criminal offense to lie under oath. And the judge said so. Now, these are women who seem to have not entirely truthfully accused a man of sexual violence uh, towards them. He was found not guilty, at least in all the counts so far. And the judge said they lied under oath. Do you think that these women are going to be pursued for the crime of lying under oath. Uh, no, I have no idea. I haven't followed that at all. No, so. but do you, do you think that women in general um, are treated, do you think men and women are treated equally in the court systems? Well, I should hope so. They should be. I, I agree with you that they should be, but they won't be. And I can guarantee you, beyond almost a shadow of a doubt, that these women are not going to be pursued for lying to the police and lying to the court. They're not. Not going to be pursued at all. Now, Mark Furman in the OJ trial um, used uh, the N-word to refer to blacks just under 10 years previously when describing a bad cop character to a screenwriter, and he was nailed for perjury. But these women, um, who, in my humble opinion, largely fabricated a case in order to destroy a man who had spurned them, well... They're not going to be pursued at all. And why? Because Mark Furman, having been branded as a racist in the OJ trial, nobody was going to run to his defense. On the other hand, these women, having been portrayed as noble victims, having been failed by a system that actually demanded they tell the truth, if you were to pursue uh, charges against them for lying under oath, well, every single nutty feminist and social justice warrior would fall down around your neck and make your life a living hell. And so they don't pursue the charges against the women because their lives get more difficult if they do. And they do pursue the charges against unpopular people because life gets more difficult if they don't. Well, um, to be fair to to us um, back home, this is, again, a complete mystery. Uh, What's going on with this whole, you know, social justice warrior syndrome and and, and these, I don't know why they call feminists. You know, feminists should be egalitarians, or at least used to be. That's how I understand it. That's how a lot of people understand feminism. 
Um, so uh, to us, it's it's just uh, incredible how to to what level all this has gotten. I mean, you know, um, back home. It's, but that's it's but that's still, because yes. that's 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 just sorry to interrupt, Ellie. But that's just it's just a matter of following incentives. It's just a matter of following incentives. So if feminists can convince a particular group that women are underrepresented in that group. Right. So there was um, an issue that came up, uh, I don't know, a couple of months or maybe a year ago, where I think it was a British biologist. He was 73 years old, a British scientist. He said, well, you know, the trouble with having women in science is you fall in love with them. They fall in love with you. And when you criticize them, they cry. Right. And it was kind of like a joke. Uh, but, you know, he, he ended up getting fired and, you know, all this usual junk and garbage and, and all that. And so what happens is if you can convince scientists that women are exactly the same as men women don't have kids they're not closer together on the iq curve and less spread out as men are and that women have the same amount of testosterone which to some degree drives aggression and assertiveness which you kind of need to to succeed in the sciences if you can convince everyone that men and women are the same exactly then all disparities, again, must be due to male sexism. And what that means is that you can get yourself a tasty six-figure salary as a diversity coordinator, as a gender equity consultant, and you can get lot, paid lots of money. And then what you can do is you can initiate policies that discriminate against men, and then you get to hand out jobs to women. So you are in the position of creating jobs, of handing out jobs, and women benefit because women get relatively cushy government scientist jobs that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten if they were in free competition with men. So there's huge amounts of incentives because you just, you hand out free stuff, you hand out free stuff to people. Um, and so, and so, so hang on. So, so what happens is if people are going to give you free advantages, I mean, who wouldn't take those, especially if you believe that you're doing the right thing and uh, gender equity and, you know, you're rising in historical injustice of the patriarchy and so on. So you get your, your, your fundamentalism of feels goodness. Oh, it feels like I'm just such a wonderful human being addressing all these equities and so on. And you get well paid for doing so. So you get moral posturing self-congratulation, which is like a drip, drip opium, opiate for, for most people. You get moral self-congratulation. You get prestige, you get to be a groundbreaker, and you get a plum six-figure-plus job, a six-figure, $100,000 or more job with tenure, with summers off, with sabbaticals. I mean, who wouldn't want that? I mean, trying to convince people to not do that is trying to go to a poor person who just won a million dollars in the lottery and say, well, you shouldn't really cash that in because the government's going to have to print the money to pay you that, and it's going to dilute the value of money for other people, and it's going to take more than a million dollars out of your account. They're going to be like, get out of my way. I'm going to cash my ticket in. So in a sense, I don't blame the people for wanting free stuff. I don't want, I mean, of course, it's just, it's really up to philosophers to make a good case as to why that's immoral and up to people to actually listen to philosophers, but then there are other people out there offering them a far more pleasurable experience of being, of being um, told what they want to hear. And so, I mean, you don't see feminists saying, well, I find that women are vastly underrepresented in the sewage cleaning business. So we're going to create these giant programs to get more women into the sewage cleaning business and the garbage man business and the lumberjack business and the hauling wood and rocks business and the moving business and you know like they just don't say that we need more female coal miners because there aren't enough black and boobs in the world you know like they don't because the women don't want those jobs of course they don't want equity in the areas where women don't want to be they want equity in the areas that is free stuff for women i mean it's got nothing to do with equity as a whole it's just your usual socialist cash grab right you know um you're demanding to um Again, it, it, to me, it just comes back to egalitarianism. So, you know, um, nowadays uh, a woman can do whatever she wants, right? She can, you know, like I said, Lithuania has a, a, Lithuania, um, a woman president. So for us, you know, that's it. You do have um, equal opportunities. You can do whatever. And that's it. That's where it stops. Whereas it seems like, you know, in, in the States and Western Europe, um, they don't want to be just, you know, they don't just want equal opportunities, but they want, they want privilege, right? Um, so if, if, if you want privilege, that means you're somehow less fortunate or less capable. So, <laughs> essentially, they're demeaning themselves. So, what the hell is what the hell's 
I, I just I just fail to understand this whole thing. Yeah, but people people can't legitimately and believably say I want something for nothing at the expense of innocent people, right? I mean, because that that's a pretty <laughs> tough thing to sustain, you know. I mean, that's basically just being a mugger, right? <laughs> so people, what they want to say is. I should have had more, but historically it was stolen from me. So this is restitution or reparations. It's just making things equal again to give me a whole bunch of free stuff because stuff was stolen from me in the past. And that's the poor and that's the third world and that's women and that's other minorities. And stuff has been stolen from me. I just want my bike back, mean Mr. Bike Stealer. I mean, this all because, you know, just saying, well, I want to disadvantage men who've never been sexist towards me so that I can get free stuff at the expense of others, well, that's a little tougher to sell than, uh, well, you know, uh, historically there's been an exclusion and it's unfair and all these people have benefited and now it's time to even things out so we've got to take a little bit from these people. It's just, you know, that, I mean, that's just the sales job. That's what sophists do is they make theft taste like meringue. Right, well, uh, again, just mentioned, this, you know, historically, um uh, the, this was denied to me, or I was somehow, you know, uh, which would just all go back, like, oh, historically this country uh, was occupied by that country, and so on and so forth. Well, you know, if we go back there, then the whole world needs to go to war, like right now, because there's so there used to be so many um, disputes over land and territory and so on and so forth that, you know, if we want to even everything out, everyone just needs to go to war then, if, if that's the logic that the people follow. I mean, it's, if you want to see something funny, I think you're right, but if you want to see something funny, you can do a we'll link to this below. There's an Imger or Imger picture. The defense ministers of Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, and Germany versus the defense minister of Russia. And the defense ministers of Sweden, Norway, the Netherlands, and Germany are like these smiley, happy ladies who look like they're all getting together to create a bake sale uh, to send kidneys to the third world. Uh, you know, very, very nice people. You can almost smell the aroma of banana bread uh, and privilege coming off them. Whereas the, the defense minister of Russia, who's below in this picture, you know, is like a dour guy who looks like not a single facial smile muscle in his entire gene pool and looks like Kevin Spacey constipated about to shit an ICBM sideways. And just the idea that, you know, who would you want to give your defense to? Uh, these nice ladies who don't mind showing a bit of leg and who dye their hair or this dour looking Russian guy who looks like he ate a tank for breakfast. Um, I think I know who I'd go with. Right. And, and you know, that's, that is pretty much uh, one of the challenges of today for us. I mean, you know, the Baltic countries, the four countries. Um, on the West, we have, um, what, what do you have, hashtags, you know, and, and, and some Facebook posts. And on the other hand is Russia, and it's very, the danger is very real, you know. We warned um, the West about Georgia. When, when Russia invaded Georgia, we said, oh, it's not going to end there. Ukraine next. And, of course, we were called, oh, you know, you're just being paranoid, you little crybabies. Um, then Ukraine happened, you know, oh, Crimea is occupied by Russia right now, right? And, and it's not going to stop there as well. Um, but... Uh, is listening to us and to top that off i mean right now you know poland and hungary especially they're being called racist and nazis and fascists because they don't want the uh the third world migrants into their country so we, we kind of well and so you know, sorry sorry so, again. so so those countries th this is the choice you send bad words our way we'll send muslim migrants your way now i can ignore your bad words i'm not sure you'll be able to ignore the migrants Exactly. That's exactly what's happening. Right. So as far as what the solution is, well, people, you know, everybody has that choice. Every culture, every individual, every country, every civilization has that choice. And the choice is, do you want to listen to the people who are going to tell you what you want to hear and make you feel good in the moment? Or do you want to listen to the people who are going to tell you the truth, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable in the moment? You know, if you've got an odd lump in your body, you go to a doctor, do you want the doctor to say, oh, it's fine, it's nothing, just going to go away on its own, don't worry about it? Or do you want the guy to say, I don't know, we've got to get a biopsy, I don't know, let's go find out what that thing is. Well, the first guy is going to make you feel good and you can walk out of there feeling better. Second guy is going to make you feel bad, but could very well save your life. Right, and just 
the last question, I guess. Um, what do you think um, a course of action should be for like every individual who feels that something should be done, but are not quite sure what exactly because they're not, you know, they're not public um, figures, they're not politicians, they're just regular people. Um, they feel oh, that no, no. there should no, be no. change, but. No, the excuse of being a regular person has not held since the late 90s when the internet came along. Everybody has a platform. Everybody has a platform. Everybody can speak to the entire world. Everybody. Everybody has a megaphone that can be heard across the four corners of the planet. So, you know, whether there are politicians, God, I mean, who really listens to and trusts politicians or, or the mainstream media and newspapers are dying a papery death? So you get out there, you speak the truth, you raise your barbaric yorp above the rooftops of the world and you bring facts to people. And you can bring facts to people in your personal life. You can bring facts to people on the internet. You can bring facts to people socializing. You can bring facts to people. Have uncomfortable conversations with people. Bring information to people that they need to hear and take the bullets, so to speak. You know, people might dislike you. They might get upset with you. They might shun you. They might, yeah. It's still better than war, people. <laughs> it's still better than war, at least for men. Absolutely, but uh, okay, promise the real last thing um what scares me the most i guess is people who are absolutely indifferent you know you can try talking to them and bring their attention to things but they're just absolutely completely not interested like you know um when when brussels good no sorry to interrupt but but don't let those people stop you ellie don't let those people stop you don't the people who just don't want to hear and la 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 they put their hands you know, so in their ears. So long as they're personally they, not inconvenienced, they're not going to do anything. They're not going to. They're just good. No, I look. Okay, fine, fine. You know what the great thing is about telling people the truth? You don't care a goddamn bit when the evils they ignore take them down. You absolve yourself of responsibility and you absolve yourself of any emotional impulse to mourn their ending. That's the benefit. That's the gift you get from talking to indifferent people. You say to somebody for 40 years, you got to quit smoking. Listen, I'll get you into smoking cessation program. I'll buy your nicorette. You got to quit smoking. And the guy's like, ah, you're, you're an asshole. You're, you're a jerk. Stop interfering with my pleasure. You're wrong. Smoking is good for you. And you bring him the facts and you bring him the facts. And then he gets uh, sick and are you going to mourn bitter tear? No. Guy had 40 years of opportunities to turn around, to change his mind. You don't owe him a lung anymore. Well, that's what happens to stupid. It ends. So you can go to all the people and you can tell people all the truth. And this is my gift to myself in the future. I'll tell you this very personally, Ellie, heart to heart. I've not talked about this before, but this is my gift to myself in the future, is that I worked as hard as humanly possible to bring as much dangerous truth to the world as I could. I worked as hard as humanly possible. And what that means is that if the civilizations, the cultures, and the countries that had one click away access to what I'm saying, If those cultures and countries ignore me, attack me, insult me, slander me, deride me, then if they end, I am free of mourning. I am free of sadness. I am free of regret because I did everything I could, made everything as available as humanly possible, took bullets and risks that almost nobody else in the world in this kind of public sphere is taking, brought as much and as entertaining and as engaging and as enjoyable. A show, a conversation, facts, experts, my books are all free. The videos are all free. You can't even bring up the cynicism of, oh, he just wants YouTube revenue because I don't get any, not one penny. So I have made this conversation as accessible as humanly possible. The facts are right there. One click away. I'm even doing videos that are less than a minute long now. The facts are easily available, which means no one has a single goddamn excuse for ignorance. Because if you've heard this and you've listened to this and you haven't shared it and you know how important it is, then 
If people who ignore reality get wiped out, I will not mourn. Because they did it to themselves with everyone yelling, turn back, turn back, turn back. Here are the facts. Turn back, turn back, turn back. And if they just sleepwalk off a cliff because they can't be bothered to wake up, I will not mourn that. That is my gift to myself in the future. I hope they listen, just as you hope the person who's quitting smoking is going to listen. But if you've tell, told someone for 40 years that they're eating too much, that they're going to get sick, they're going to get diabetes, they're going to have problems. Well, let's say that they get sick. They lose an eye and they say, well, now you've got to donate an eye to me. I'm like, nope. Sorry, I'm sorry, but I have no regret because this is what nature does to people who ignore reality. It's not my fault. It's not my doing. In fact, I'm doing everything I can to prevent and avoid these disasters. But I will look at it in the future. I will not be happy about it, but I guarantee you this. I will shed not one tear, not one single solitary tear for the fate of those who steadfastly refuse to listen to reason and evidence. And that's the gift you give to yourself by telling people what the facts are, what the reality is, what the most likely consequences are of the current course of action. And if they mock and laugh and attack and if you, you're racist, you say, okay. So if you're that hateful and horrible a human being that you attack people telling you simple truths designed to help save your life, well, are you going to mourn their passing? Let me give you the last analogy. We'll go back to the smoker. So you say to someone, listen, you, you really better. No, I've used the smoker one. Let me try another one. Some woman wants to get married to a guy, got a criminal record for violence, got all the tattoos you could imagine, doesn't have a job, and beat up his last three girlfriends, putting one of them in the hospital. And... She wants to get married to this guy. And you say, listen, you, you, you can't. I mean, this is a disaster. This man has got bad news written all over him. It's going to end badly. And she's like, you just hate the fact that I'm in love. You're just a bitter old person who just hates the fact that I've found love and you haven't. And then she writes what a bad person you are all over the Internet. And she gets you fired. And she starts spreading terrible rumors about you to all of your friends. And then she tells your children what a terrible person you are. And she just works as hard as she can to make your life a living hell. And let's say her husband comes home drunk and she needles him and she bitches at him and she nags him and she starts to hit him. And then he clocks her and breaks her nose. Ellie, what would you feel in that situation? <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's a perfect analogy. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I leave that to the listeners, too. Be honest with yourself. Yeah. The woman you tried to help tried to destroy your life, provoked a situation that was easily avoidable, and is suffering negative consequences. What do you feel? I'm not even going to tell you what I feel. I guess the people on the video can have some sense of it. But that's the gift you give to yourself when you try to help people, is that if they attack and reject you, you are not obligated to feel a goddamn thing about the fate they have willingly stepped over you to march towards. You can't fix stupid, but reality sure can, and it always does. All right, I'm going to end the show there, but thank you very much. To the callers, as always, a great pleasure to chat with y'all, the best, smartest, wisest, and hopefully most generous listeners, freedomainradio.com slash donate to help out the show. Let me try it again, but without screaming <laughs> or that weird little half scream I do. Freedomainradio.com slash donate, he said in his best Venus Rising FM voice. And uh, FDRURL.com slash Amazon to use our affiliate link. It costs you nothing. You're going to go buy something. Just, you know, bookmark it. Just put it in your uh, – put it in your um, – set of pages that open up when you open your browser, just in case you want to do any shopping. It won't do you any harm. And it helps us 
and uh, FDR URL, sorry, FDRpodcasts.com, FDRpodcasts.com uh, to share podcasts. Uh, you can do that very easily. And last but not least, freedomainradio.com slash free if you'd like to pick up some of the free books that I've talked about. We need your help, of course, as we continue to grow. Um, reason stands between us and certain disaster uh, on a global scale. I think we're one of the pillars in the way. I hope that you will help us out. Like, subscribe, and share what it is that we're doing. If it's not you, it's no one, at least in your world. So thank you, everyone, so much. Have yourselves a wonderful week. I guess we'll be talking to you tomorrow night on the next call in show.